Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Healthy Aging Lecture. It is 11 o'clock Eastern time, and we're just going to give it another one to two minutes to let folks jump on um, the webinar. But um, I just want to let you know you're in the right place, and we will get started momentarily. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to get us rolling because um, we have a, a full hour ahead of us. Again, my name is Kate Tutwapi. I'm the manager of senior health here at Virginia Hospital Center. And um, you're joining us for our Healthy Aging Lecture Series. We have a timely topic today um, talking about COVID-19. I have to say when we scheduled this talk months ago, I don't think any of us knew exactly where we would be in the progression of uh, this uh, pandemic, but we certainly know, knew there would be a lot to talk about. So um, thank you for joining us today. Um, before I get into introducing our speaker, I want to just remind you, um, for those of you who have perhaps been on this webinar or if you're new, um, you have entered this webinar in what's called listen only mode. But that does not mean we don't want to hear from you. We definitely want your participation. And the best way to do that is to look in the control panel that, that would have popped up when you logged into this webinar. There should be a box that says questions. So start thinking about the questions you're going to want to ask Dr. Modak. And um, if he doesn't address those questions during his presentation, please feel free to type them in. in. We will be monitoring those questions and taking them at the end of uh, his presentation. Also, just so you're aware, this uh, presentation is being recorded. So everybody will get a copy of the link that you're welcome to, to share or review again. And in addition, we'll also include a copy of uh, Dr. Modak's slides. So with that, um, I'd like to get rolling with introducing our guest speaker today. We are so delighted to welcome Dr. Rohit Modak, who is a board certified infectious disease physician here at Virginia Hospital. He is the chair of the infectious disease department and has been with VHC for 14 years. Uh, he is also an assistant professor at the University, uh, Georgetown University School of Medicine. So um, as you can imagine, Dr. Modak has been on the front line for <laughs> helping to navigate not only the VHC team through all of this, but also just teams within the county, within the region. So we are just so grateful for him to be with us today, to share his thoughts where we are now with COVID and um, to give us some updates as we move forward. So with that, um, Dr. Modak, I'm gonna turn it over to you and um, let you take it away. Thank you, Kate. So good morning, everyone. I'm so glad you guys could join us. I've been dealing with COVID uh, like we all have for about one year now. And in the hospital, our, our approach to COVID has really evolved over this year, you know, going from, is this even going to come to our hospital? Should we be prepared to, of course, it came to what are our policies going to be for our staff, for our visitors, for our patients? How do we keep everyone safe? What are the best treatments? And then as we've gone through the summer with surges and then regressions, how do we keep up this fight? How do we make sure we are, you know, get through to the other side with everyone as healthy as possible? So today, what I'd like to do, you know, there's so many different things I could talk about, and I'm sure there's lots of questions which I'll be thrilled to answer. 
But I think what I'd like to do is kind of talk about some of the more interesting things to me that happened over the last year, some of the lessons that I've learned, um, and maybe an idea of kind of where things may progress. So I'll just give a few slides about some of the more interesting uh, pieces of data I've seen. And then we can have this somewhat more interactive where I can hear your questions and address what's out there. And let me encourage everyone to please put in some questions because I guarantee you, whatever question you have, there's gonna be 20 other people on this webinar who have the exact same question. So let's address it. And I'll be very uh, clear, hopefully, about what we know, what we don't know, and what I recommend. All right, so let's move forward. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so I remember first hearing about COVID. I was actually in India last Christmas in 2019, and I was flying back home from uh, the airport. It was January 1st or 2nd, and I was getting on my international flight, and I picked up my phone and just checked my email, and there was an email from one of my medical organizations, which is some headlines, and one of them said, an outbreak of pneumonia um, detected in the city in China. And I remember reading it and saying, hey, that's a little funny. And uh, you know, I wonder what's gonna happen to this. And then I didn't think much of it until a few days later when it was all over the news that there was this outbreak in China. So we know that they first reported this at the end of December, uh, this outbreak in Wuhan, and they knew it was a coronavirus a week later by January 7th. And by January 10th, they actually had the genetic sequence of the coronavirus reported. Now that's a huge, improvement from the way things were even 10 or 20 years ago. So a lot of kudos to the Chinese scientists able to identify it and then publicly put out the genetic sequencing. And that's important because that's what really laid the foundation for developing testing, developing any treatments, developing vaccines. It all started that first week in January. Next slide, please. So as January went on, we started having our first meetings at Virginia Hospital Center. We had our first case in the United States at the end of January. By the beginning of February, we started to have restrictions to and from China. And by mid to end of February, you know, we knew it was COVID-19 caused by SARS-CoV-2, what we named the virus. We knew that there were cases in the US. Can you go to the next slide, please? We knew that it was spreading. At first, it was just in uh, Washington State. And then it was in California. We saw it in the nursing home in Kirkland, Washington. There were some deaths at that time. It was concerning. We thought, could we just keep it to these areas? Uh, and we had our first case in Virginia about one year ago or so, so in early March. And of course, by this time, we didn't know it at that time, but it was in many states throughout the US by early March. We just didn't know it. Next slide. Okay. So. I mean, the rest we can say is history. We all remember what happened. Cases just exploded. So from early March to May, especially in our area here in Northern Virginia, we had this big surge of cases. And I know in our hospital, we got up to about 100 patients in the hospital with COVID. You know, we weren't seeing anyone else. Businesses were shut down. It was, I mean, we wouldn't see any friends. I mean, I'm sure everyone remembers that was something that March, April, even May, you know, it was a tremendous burden on society. So uh, this slide actually shows the number of cases per million people. And if we look at the US, we had that initial surge in March and April, then we had a second surge over the summer. Now that didn't really affect us here in Northern Virginia or the DC area, but that was really across other areas in the country. We saw a huge surge, then it came down a little bit. And then we saw this last huge surge over the winter, over November, December, even parts of January before things started getting better. And yes, things are getting better now over the last few weeks to about a month. One thing I wanna point out about the slide, which is interesting to me, is look how every surge we had, we then came down a little bit, but we didn't really come down. You know, Things got a little bit better, but we didn't drop to where, a point where no one was getting infected. We still had lots of cases. And what that means is every new case, every new surge was built upon that previous surge. It didn't really go way down. It only went a little bit down and then a new bump and then a little bit down and a new bump. So we saw a lot of cases uh, exponentially multiply. And if you look at what happened in Europe, they did it a little differently. When they had a surge, they were able to come down a little bit further than the US was. So why is that? Let's go to the next slide. If you look at how we shut down, you know, we all remember in April, 
and May, things were shut down, right? We said, oh my God, we couldn't leave the house. We were kind of trapped inside. No one was going to work except essential workers. No one was going to the grocery store, you know, unless you needed something. Um, we didn't think we were going to restaurants. We weren't going to shopping malls. We weren't going to libraries or movies. But if you look at what we did in the US at the number of people who visited such things like restaurants or movie theaters, we dropped by about 40%, which for US, we thought, wow, we really shut down. But if you look at the you know, UK, for example, they dropped by almost double what we did. So yes, we dropped a little bit, but not really that much. And of course, it's not just Northern Virginia. Think about the entire country, that there were areas where they, they didn't take it seriously. They didn't have a lot of COVID cases in their area. So they didn't think it was real. If you can go to the next slide, what if we look at pharmacies and grocery stores? So these are things that are essential, right? That we have to go to. We have to go to the grocery store to get milk and juice and whatever we need and food. But we have to go to the pharmacy to get our medicines. So we did have a drop in the US, you know, of about 20% of visits to these stores came down. But, you know, we didn't really even do that great of a job. So what I mean by that is we still, as a country, we're going to the grocery store. And it's it's not that we were going, okay, once and then buying everything we needed and not going out again for three weeks. Oh, I need milk. Let me go to the store. Oh, you know what? We're out of bread. Uh, let me send uh, my wife to the store to go get it. And we would still go to the store quite often, even though we think we were being safe. You know, perhaps we weren't doing what we should. If you look at the UK, they were much better. And other parts of Europe were even better. And you may remember what they were doing is having you know, everyone can go to the grocery store based on uh, your last name al alphabetically for one hour a day. You had to have proof that you could go. You There would be police around in Italy and you have to show them on your phone the text message that said, this is your time to go. So yes, we shut down the US and yes, it was burdensome, but it, from a public health perspective, it could have been a lot worse and maybe it should have been if we really wanted to control this virus initially. Next slide. So one thing I'm always asked is, how are we doing? How are we doing? And the best metric of this is our percent positivity. So you'll hear this on the news. And what the percent positivity is, it's the number of people who are positive from the number of people who are tested. So that's both symptomatic and asymptomatic people. And it's a general idea that it corrects for the number of tests available. You know, if there weren't a lot of, if, there, if we're testing more, then we're going to find more. So all that stuff is accurate. But this is a way to kind of level the playing field. So we really see how we're doing as a community. So this is from Arlington. I pulled the data. And our percent positivity was very high initially, right when COVID came out, that people who were getting tested had the virus. Then in the summer, even despite the surge in the rest of the country, Arlington did pretty well. We were running around at a basically a little lower than 5% rate. Then during this most recent surge in November, December, January, we got up again to the teens. And finally, over the last couple of weeks, we're down below 5%. So that's great to see now. Generally, I would say if we're over 10%, that's not very good. If we are under 5%, that is pretty good. That means the level of coronavirus in our community is at a lower level. And that's important because that means your day-to-day -day activity. So going to the grocery store, um, just you know, getting gas for your car, interacting with anyone, if the general amount of coronavirus is low, then the risk to you particularly is on the lower side. And remember, a lot of things we're talking about now is gonna be about risk. And it's not no risk or absolute risk, it's a spectrum, right? So it's about higher risk and lower risk and things we can do to lower our risk. Next slide, please. So what are the lessons we've learned over the last year? So let's talk about it. Let's talk about lessons we learned about prevention, how we can prevent this virus, about the treatments we've come across, and about even some of the uh, symptoms that tend to linger. Next slide. So we know that public health interventions work, right? You've heard about this constantly from Dr. Fauci, from any doctor on TV. Wear a mask, stay socially distanced, be outdoors if you can, wash your hands, you know, uh, avoid large gatherings, all these things. That we've, it's been drilled into our heads over and over and over again. So there are a couple of studies I like to uh, bring up, which I'll discuss with you guys today, about how it shows that masks work. So the first one was from last summer. There was a Starbucks in Korea. 
Now, a lot of these restaurants, you know, some remained open. They had less um, less capacity. They were operating at 25% capacity. But a lot of restaurants, even now in the U.S., they're open, right? And even some of these places that have outdoor seating, by the way, a little aside, when they have the tent set up so it's outdoors, you're not really outdoors if there's walls on four sides. That's basically indoors. It's the same exact thing. So that's not an extra layer of protection. Don't get fooled, please. So when you're indoors at any restaurant, coffee shop, I mean, you have to take off your mask because you have to eat and drink. So you're not doing that with the mask on. So there's gonna be people there, not just your group, but others who are unmasked, right? So that puts you at risk. In this Starbucks, a patron who was asymptomatic, so didn't know they had any symptoms, um, didn't know they were infected, but turned out later to be infected, sat in a chair in the Starbucks. It happened to be under the AC unit. So, so much about COVID is the ventilation. It's how the air is blowing, blowing this way, blowing that way, where the vents are. And we don't really know this when we're indoors somewhere, where what the airflow is. So this patron sat in a chair. It happened to be under the AC unit. And he sat there for four hours, you know, doing his work on his computer, drinking his coffee. 27 patrons, so these are other customers who were sitting there in and out at different times, became infected, linked to this first case. So that's a lot. However, Four employees who were there for the whole time, who were masked, because remember, they're not eating or drinking, they're wearing their mask, they did not get infected. So that's huge. I mean, think about that. Wearing a mask protected these people, even if COVID was around them. That's why masking is so important. There was another case in a hair salon in Missouri. This also was from August or September. There were two stylists who happened to be symptomatic. So they had symptoms. So this is when they're most contagious, right when they have symptoms. They were wearing a mask and everyone who walked into that hair salon wore a mask, even during their haircuts, because this was the policy of the store. So everyone's masked. They found out these two uh, people were positive. The Department of Health then started doing tracing, which means they contacted, okay, who were your customers? Out of the 139 clients, they were able to interview 104 clients and test 67 people they found zero infections. So what does that mean? Well, that means masks work both ways. Number one, it protects the, the patron. Uh, it protects the client. It also prevents spreading from a person who's masked. So that's important because if you have COVID, wearing a mask prevents you from spreading it and masks work. I mean, I have example after example of things like this. Now, of course, there's always exceptions. You're gonna hear about cases. We see a case where Everyone was masked, but still someone got infected. You know, I take it back to, are people really wearing their masks right? How many times do you see people wearing the masks under their nose or on their chin, or they take down their mask to talk? Guess what? That's not wearing the mask the right way. So if people wear the masks the right way, it really decreases the risk of infection. Next slide, please. So we know the social uh, we know these these public health measures work. One common question I get is, well, wait a minute. If I'm exposed to someone with coronavirus and I get tested and I'm negative, then I'm fine, right? Why do I need to quarantine? And I'll tell you, that's a great question. And this slide is a wonderful slide. It's probably one of the most important slides I'm going to show today that answers this question. So let's run through this scenario. The virus has an incubation period of 14 days. What does that mean? That means that, that if you're exposed to the virus, so you go to work and then that night you get a call and they say, hey, um, Jill, your person you share the office with just came down with coronavirus. She was just tested and found to be positive. So, and you were exposed to her. That means that for 14 days, you can get symptoms. That virus can be working in you and you can feel great, but it's a 14 day period that you can actually develop the infection. Now we think that you're infectious about two days before you get symptoms. So that's another big problem with this virus. You don't have to have symptoms to transmit the virus. So let's look at this example. Let's say Kate was exposed to the virus on day zero. And she calls her doctor and says, hey, I just got a call from the public health department or my office. And they said that uh, someone has the virus in my office. Um, what should I do? And then her doctor says, oh, well, why don't we test you just to see? She says, okay, great. So on day five, she gets tested and it comes back negative. Kate says, okay, I feel great. I'm tested. It's been about a week. What's the problem? I'm fine. 
So I don't have COVID. So she goes back to work. She meets her family for a gathering. Um, and everything's great. But two days later, she starts developing symptoms, goes and gets tested again for COVID and is positive. Now, everyone she interacted with on day eight is at risk. They are all, we call it PUIs, persons under investigation. And in this scenario, 22 people who were exposed to Kate came down with the virus. So she's super contagious. And I just wanna tell everyone, I mean, it's not, it's not just that, oh, I accidentally spread the virus. I mean, this is doing harm. In so many cases we see of these events, out of those 22 people, how many have high risks for having a bad outcome? That means how many people are elderly, you know, over 60 or 70? How many have diabetes? How many are obese? How many have kidney disease? How many of these people now are going to be hospitalized and how many are going to die? I mean, these are preventable cases, preventable hospitalizations and preventable deaths if we just follow the rules. And you know, in this example, Kate's not trying to do the wrong thing. She doesn't know that she's contagious, but it's so important to follow the guidelines and to have a good understanding that you need to be quarantined for 14 days. That's the incubation period, that's the risk. It's not wrong that she got tested on, five, on day five uh, because she was worried and she wants to know. It's not wrong to get tested, but you have to know what to do with that information. And a, a negative test doesn't clear you many times. You have to be very clear about what things mean. Next slide, please. So what has happened though over time is that things have gotten better. So this is a study out of NYU. Mortality means the number of people who die. Back in March and April, in this in NYU, and remember there's a huge outbreak in New York, they were seeing a 25% mortality. That means one out of four people who came to the hospital with COVID died. That's a lot. Um, so, I mean, that's too much. Does that mean COVID is terrible? Well, as the summer went on, things got a lot better and it went down to 5%. And that's even correcting for age and other medical problems. You know, all things being equal, you had a better chance of surviving later in the summer. And, and that low mortality rate continues now to this day. So things were a lot worse in the beginning. Why is that? So first we have increase in clinical experience, right? We didn't know what we were doing in the beginning. This is a novel virus. We didn't have any treatments. We didn't know necessarily what works or what didn't work. Should we put the patient on the ventilator early? Should we delay ventilation? Are there any medicines we can do? You know, what we didn't know what to do in the beginning. Also, there was surges in the beginning. As the summer went on, there were less hospital volumes. So what does that mean? That means we can take our time. We can think about each patient. We're not overwhelmed. People get better care when doctors are not overwhelmed. We have some medicines, and I'll discuss that on the next slide. We learned about non-pharmacologic treatment. So for example, laying patients on their stomach in the hospital, that helps the oxygen get into the lungs in different areas of the lungs better. It seems simple enough. It helps save lives. We learned that as the summer went on. Also, we started wearing masks more in the hospital. We made everyone wear a mask. We give masks to our patients. If you guys remember in the community, at first we were saying, don't wear masks, uh, save them for healthcare workers. By May, they were saying to everyone, yes, wear a mask when you go out. So that, that happened. And then what does that do? Well, that protects the person that also protects spread. So even if someone is exposed to the virus, maybe it's actually less virus that's being transmitted. So their illness is less severe. Next slide, please. We also know about treatments of this virus. So I'm gonna separate this into two things, into hospitalized patients or inpatients and outpatients. So for hospitalized patients, we now have, we have a few medicines we can give that seems to help. So we give steroids. We give steroids to almost everyone who's admitted and on oxygen with coronavirus. Steroids have shown to save lives. This is the one thing we can do that can save lives. For hospitalized patients, that's where the data is. We have an antiviral, remdesivir. It tends to prevent the progression of the disease, so it does help. There's also mixed studies about anti-inflammatory drugs because we know the way we think about COVID, there's the acute illness where the virus is replicating and you're getting sick. And then there's this inflammatory response that takes over, which is really why people get super sick and they're in our ICU. 
So we have some medicines and we offer all of these at Virginia Hospital Center, you know, we evaluate every case for the right patient. So yes, we have some medicines now for hospitalized patients. The problem is what about the outpatient? So patients who test positive for coronavirus and are maybe sick, but aren't sick enough to be in the hospital. So we don't really have good medicines. This has been a big hole in our therapy and there's lots of studies going on, but we don't have any proven medicines. The closest thing we have is monoclonal antibodies. So you may recall this, Trump got this when he first got sick. Um, the idea is these are antibodies specifically against coronavirus that's supposed to help you, help prevent you from getting sicker and sicker. In studies, it does seem to show a reduction in hospitalization for the right patient. The question is, does it reduce mortality? Is it gonna save a life? And we don't know that yet, but we think for the high-risk patients, so those people over 65 who are obese, who have diabetes, who have chronic kidney disease, maybe this will help prevent you from getting worse. If you fall into this category, if you have illness with COVID-19 and you're at home, maybe a monoclonal antibody is right for you. It's something that you need to talk to your doctor about. And we have this at Virginia Hospital Center. Again, it's not for patients who are hospitalized. It does not work in patients who are hospitalized. That's what the data shows. So we have it only for outpatients. If you qualify, it's not a game changer. We don't know that yet, but it's at least something we can offer. And really what we're doing now, we're struggling to find treatments. What can we give patients? Okay, next slide, please. The other thing we're noticing is that people have these prolonged symptoms. They call this long COVID, right? That once people get COVID, they tend to have lasting syndromes. They don't feel like themselves. And this absolutely is true. A lot of hospitals, a lot of uh, academic centers in the country are studying this. Locally, I know GW has a long COVID clinic. So for example, they looked at um, patients who never weren't hospitalized. This is patients who had coronavirus and they looked at them with 14 to 21 days later, 35% said, hey, you know, I'm not right yet. Something's wrong. It's not just a common cold. And we always say, even for young people, you know, oh, maybe you won't be hospitalized. It'll be just like a cold, but it's not. There's something different about this virus. 20% of them still don't feel right after a few weeks. It's usually cough, fatigue, maybe brain fog. And of course, the more, um, the older you are or the more other medical problems you have, the more likely you are to suffer from these things. Next slide. It does happen in patients who are home. It absolutely happens in patients who are hospitalized. Here's a study out of Italy looking at patients who are hospitalized 60 days later, so two months after their illness started, 87% still had symptoms. The most common symptoms, fatigue, shortness of breath, uh, just joint pains, chest pains. People aren't right. And it's so funny, you know, we've studied this and you look at people's labs, they're all normal. You you know, you look at everything, there's nothing particular we can say. There's not a medicine that we can give that helps. And that's why it's being studied, that hopefully we can come up with something, but we just don't know right now. And this is, I mean, this is a problem, right? And if anyone has COVID, I mean, you tell me, are you back to normal? I hope you are, but many people are not. If you have loved ones who have COVID, they'll tell you something's not right and it's a problem. And that's why I'll go back to what I said in the beginning, the best treatment is prevention. If you don't have COVID, you don't wanna get COVID. That's why things like vaccine, wearing a mask, social distancing, doing what you can is so important. Um, you know, if you do, if you had COVID, hopefully you can get better, but there's so much we don't know yet. And it's just, you wanna do your best to avoid it. Next slide, please. So when will we be back to normal? Is this my next slide? Okay, that's fine. I'll, I'll talk about this slide. I get this question a lot. When are things getting better? So at first things look great, right? Right now, what's happening in the last month? We have decreasing numbers of COVID. The vaccine is being rolled out. Hopefully many of you have gotten it. I know many of you are interested and still can't, but hopefully that's improving. You know, more and more is coming out. Are we getting to herd immunity? You know, the estimate is that we know 29 million people have had COVID. We know maybe about 15 to 20 million have gotten two doses of the vaccines. Many more have gotten at least one dose. We know there's many people who have COVID that we haven't even diagnosed yet or, or have had in the past that never got a test. 
So are we getting to the point where we're getting 40, 50, 60, 70% of Americans uh, who should be somewhat immune? We have more treatment options coming out. So things are looking up, right? Things are getting better. The problem is there's so many unknowns. So first off, what about these variants, right? How is that gonna play out? We know they're everywhere. They're rising in numbers. Is that gonna make everyone sick again? Are the vaccines gonna be able to prevent it? We don't know how the vaccines are gonna do. Initially, everything looks great. But really, you know, as time goes on, we'll get more and more data. How efficacious is the vaccine? How long will immunity last? Is it different if you had the virus? Is it different if you've gotten the vaccine? Will it be three months? Will it be six months? Will it be forever? Will it be a year? What about the variants? Are you immune to these variants if you've had the infection or vaccine? Finally, what about pandemic fatigue? I'm sure you guys have seen this. Back in March and April of last year, everyone was happy to stay at home. Oh my God, I'm so scared. You know, and then after that, it's, oh, well, I have to go out. I, I, I can't live like this anymore. I have to see someone. I have to see my family for Thanksgiving or for Christmas. Oh, I, I, I'm willing to do a little something. It's not worth what we're up to. So as that sets in, as we get over a year into this, that's gonna increase risk. Next slide, please. So what can we do to stay safe? And you guys may have seen this slide before. It's the MODAC rules. And this is how you can stay safe, basically how you can lower your risk. M for mask. Wearing a mask works. It needs to cover your mouth and your nose. And those you're with has to wear a mask. If you're wearing a mask, the person who's sitting across from you should be wearing a mask as well. Number two, outdoors. I can't stress this enough, especially with the weather getting a little bit better now. It's so much safer to be outdoors. Is it the UV light? Is it the wind? Is it everything? It is, yes. Stay outdoors. If you meet someone, meet outdoors. That's going to make you 100 times safer. Number three, distance. Stay six feet apart. Yes, this virus is transmitted by multiple means. It's droplets, which means it comes out and probably drops around three to six feet. So if you're over six feet, it's safer. It's also airborne. We know it can fly in currents somewhere. So six, you know, it's not that five and a half feet you're in high risk and six and a half feet you're completely safe, but six feet is a good rule of thumb. Avoid crowds. If you're with meeting up with three other people, okay, there's a risk there. It doubles if you're with six people. You know, then it's what everyone's up to, what everyone that they're with is up to. So avoid crowds. And finally, know the risks of those around you. So yes, you want to get together with a friend for a walk. I think that's great. I do that all the time. But I'm also not getting together with someone who is high risk, who doesn't believe in masking, who goes to indoor restaurants all the times and thinks, oh, it's fine. This is no big deal. So what? Because there's a higher likelihood that they've been exposed because of their behavior. And that means it's a higher likelihood that I've been exposed. So please follow the MODAC rules. If you do two out of the top three, that's my rule of thumb for generally staying safe. If you can do that, absolutely you can meet people. Just follow the rules and you should stay safe. That should be low risk. And I think that's it. Is that my last slide? Yes, that is so, Dr. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you guys for your attention. I'm happy to have a discussion, answer any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that presentation. And I'm just going to leave it on this slide we move forward. Um, we do have a lot of questions that rolled in. Um, so I'm going to ask my coworker, Margo, if she could turn on her mic and maybe get us started, Margo, with the questions. We have some great questions. So um, we'll start with how did the how has the U.S. done compared to other countries, do you feel? How does the U.S. what? You, how has the United States done in regards to COVID compared to other countries? <laughs> um, I think, so a couple of things, right? I, I think that we have not done a good job in general. And, you know, you could blame a, a lot of things of what you want. And I don't think that even... Well, let's look, let's look back at the last year. So I think there was a problem rolling out testing. We couldn't, we didn't have enough tests. We didn't have enough PPE. We didn't have a lot of that for a long time. Um, and a lot of that I think could have been changed by a, little, by a stronger federal presence in treating. Um, I think the CDC was under a lot of political pressure, right? And they would make guidelines, not necessarily based on science. There was a distrust of the CDC, which I have not seen happen through previous, through Ebola, through H1N1, through the first SARS, there's been a lot of outbreaks and the CDC has been wonderful. And I think it really dropped the ball in the last year. So I think the US 
you know, the public messaging. How, how is it okay that half the country doesn't think masks help when science clearly shows that? You know, if we just all wore masks, this would have been a lot better. So I think there was a lot of problems in the US. However, let's keep in mind that a lot of countries that did support mask use and rolled out testing well, and a lot of European countries or Canada, they also had huge outbreaks. So I'm not trying to suggest that if things had went differently, that there would have been no problem. This is a global pandemic. There, it was going to be a problem one way or another. I do think there were a lot of preventable deaths, which really, truly really just stinks. I mean, it's, it's disgusting, but um, it would have been a horrible, it's a horrible situation no matter what. Um, and I think also because of that, until we solve the problem globally, it's not gonna get better. So even if the US has masking, testing, uh, contact tracing, we do everything right, you know, we're, we're connected to everyone. And that's just the way it is. We are not going to be able to stop this virus until the entire world is vaccinated, that we all get everyone under control. Wonderful. Um, we have the question, which I knew would come up. What are your thoughts about the schools reopening? So I think we need to understand when people ask COVID questions, um, including schools, when they're asking, you know, the CDC, should schools reopen? They're asking the government. There's many competing factors. So I will, I'll go back to last uh, August or September. There, were, there was talk, should schools open? And the American Academy of Pediatrics said, yes, we think it's important for schools to open. We think that you know when kids go to school, yes, they go to learn. They also go for social interaction. It's part of their healthy development to be in school, be with their peers, and to just to get through things. Now, if you ask me just from a COVID point of view, right? What can we do to stay safe? Keep everyone at home. We should lock all the doors, keep everyone, you know, if everyone just sat in their own room, locked the door for two weeks, it would die out because you can't spread COVID then. But that's not feasible. Of course it's not, right? There's many other important issues. And when they say, should restaurants open? Should businesses open? I mean, these are people's livelihoods, right? That that people, if, if their store is closed, their restaurant's closed, they lose money, they're out of a job, they lose their housing. There's a lot of social issues at play here. With schools, of course, it's, you know, school is also where kids go to school so parents can earn a living. Otherwise, there's there's um, food insecurity. There's a lot of issues that go along with this. So should schools reopen? You know, yes, I think they absolutely should. I think it's been shown that they can reopen safely, that, even in times of outbreaks, uh, CDC has put out a lot of good studies about this, that there doesn't seem to be a lot of transmission in schools. There doesn't seem to be a lot of transmission from a child in school to the parent at home. Of course it's possible, of course it happens, but generally it seems to be safe. And I think it's super important to have our kids get back to school. My kids are going back to school. I signed them up back in August, thinking they would go back in September, October. Um, they didn't of course, but now they're going back in the next week or two to school, it's hybrid learning in my district, but that's fine. And they're gonna go back two days a week. And I'm excited for that. I think it's important for their development to go back to school. So to add on to that, how about the gym somebody brought up? Would you, what are your thoughts on going back to the gym? You know, I'm really nervous about the gym. I, I used to love going to the gym and I have not gone and I'm not planning to go. So the reason is, there was actually a study this week that the CDC put out uh, looking at two gyms. I think one was in Minnesota, one was in Hawaii. And, you know, again, I, it's hard for these gym, for gym owners and for people who want to work out and they try to do things safely. They, they mandate masks, uh, they limit capacity to 25%, they're wiping down everything. I, I agree, you know, you're doing what you're supposed to do. But the problem is if someone's exercising uh, intensely and you take off your mask and these studies in the CDC, it was a spin class where you didn't have to wear a mask during class. So there was a huge transmission because the instructor was asymptomatic, got symptoms later, but spread it to everyone in that class who was not masked. So this is going to happen. And and it's, it's awful and you know it shouldn't happen. But what can we do? Can we all wear masks? Again, yes, I think you should. Do you trust everyone wearing a mask? I mean, you guys see what I see. You're out there. You see people don't know how to wear a mask, right? You see people pull down the mask to talk. You know, it's hard because you have to now trust everyone in that gym. And I'm not saying you're definitely going to get COVID if you go to a gym, um, but it's a risk. And you have to think about your own risk tolerance. And I would strongly encourage, and I know it's easy for me to say, I'm a doctor, right? I can 
I can say, well, why don't you just get a treadmill at home? And I know that's not feasible for a lot of people. You know, but try to do something different. Can you go for a walk outside? Can you do squats and push-ups at home? Can you do body weight exercises? It's not ideal, but I don't think it's the right time to go back to gyms yet. I'm still nervous about that. Having said that, I know other doctors who do go back to the gym who say we're always masked, they limit the spread. I'm always six feet apart from people. And you know, of course, I, I hope I wish for the best for them, but obviously their risk is a little higher than mine, and their risk tolerance is higher than mine is. Well, to add on to that, we have a healthy group here. Our seniors are healthy um, um, in the Arlington area. What if they're vaccinated? Do you still still recommend not going back to the gym? So that's a great question. I get that question for a lot of things because now more and more people are getting vaccinated. Do we need to wear a mask? Do we need to quarantine? Do we need to do this, 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 or this? The way I would approach it is there are certain things that increase your risk and certain things that lower your risk. So wearing a mask lowers your risk. Um, that being vaccinated absolutely lowers your risk. Staying socially distanced lowers your risk. Getting together with a large group of people increases your risk. Going to a gym increases your risk. So you have to just kind of weigh the risks and benefits. I think, so I'm vaccinated. I'm still not going to go to the gym. And I'll, I'll tell you because the vaccine is not 100%. It's very good. It's 90% effective. I think the Johnson Johnson vaccine should be out soon. They're meeting today. That's going to be 70 or 80% effective. It's going to be 90% effective at preventing severe disease, which is excellent. It's going to be an excellent vaccine. And if offered, I recommend everyone get it. Um, if you haven't been vaccinated already, get what you can get. But at the same time, none of these are 100%. We don't know. We have cases of people who were vaccinated and get infected. We have people who were infected in the past and are reinfected again with COVID. It's not common. It happens. How are these variants going to change things? We know the vaccine is not as effective against the variants. It's still very good, but it's not as effective. And like I said, prevention is the best treatment. This is an infection you don't want to get if you can avoid it. So another great question. If you are tested on day five after you're exposed and it comes back negative, are you, you good on that day five? Is that the, or should you assume? So why you want to get tested. So some people want to get tested because they're just nervous. I need to get tested. I need to get tested. And, you know, I, I, it's never wrong to get testing as long as you know what to do. It's not wrong to have more information. Um, let's say the reason I would test someone is, okay, if you're positive, now I know that's more likely to make you stay in and take this seriously. Whereas maybe you, you know, by day seven or eight, you would say, eh, I feel fine. I'm going to go out anyway. I don't care. And unfortunately, people do that. They don't follow the quarantine. We know that usually people develop symptoms between days five and 10. That's on average, although it's up to 14 days. So it's reasonable to get tested on day five, but you got to know what to do with that. Maybe if you're positive, that would also affect how you interact with your family, right? That now they're PUIs because they're, they live with you, so they have to be quarantined. So you want to know that earlier than later. If you are positive, now it's a whole different, now you're not a PUI, now you're positive. So now it's a different isolation guideline. So maybe you want to know that as soon as possible. So there's reasons to get tested early, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't absolve you of doing what you have to do. This is an interesting question. Um, somebody was saying they can't wrap their head around the whole concept that we can still pass it to each other when we are vaccinated. Do you know of some of the new vaccinations that are coming out are going to um, be that, that we aren't passing it to each other? Like, So we think that the vaccines will help prevent transmission, right? But we don't know for sure, and because that's a hard study to do. So for example, let's say you're vaccinated. We know that most people who are vaccinated are asymptomatic. We also know that when we swab people's nose, let's say this, and I'm, the numbers aren't exact, right? But I just read a study. I think it was the um, it was the Moderna vaccine. I read a study that said when they swabbed you, they had about, I think we said it was 90% effective uh, for people who were symptomatic, but it was about, was it 60 or 70% effective for when they just swabbed you, just to check. So that means there were 20 to 30% of people who tested positive or tested, and remember it's a PCR test, but felt great. Now, if you have a positive test, does that mean you're contagious? And that's something we don't know. PCR is just the DNA of the virus. So if you're exposed to someone and you're vaccinated and you're not getting sick, maybe there's not enough DNA 
of the virus to act for you to actually spread it. But maybe there is. These are little things that we just don't know. And I don't know how we're ever going to know that. So I think the safest thing to do is to assume that you can be contagious. Now, of course, overall, when you're vaccinated, you have a less likelihood of having the virus on you um, in your nose that it gets to a point where you can spread it. So yes, your likelihood of spreading it is lower, but it's not zero. Like things in medicine, you know, we can't say your risk for anything is zero. It lowers risk. It's all about risk reduction. And that's why it's so important to get vaccinated. So someone asked regarding like the safety of the vaccine for each individual. So the question involved being asymptomatic for COVID and then uh, is there a risk of getting the vaccine? Um, so this vaccine, uh, or risk the mRNA vaccines, which are what's out now, the COVID, the uh, Moderna and the Pfizer, you know, we were all a little worried in the beginning because this was a novel technology. We say novel technology, um, but it's been really developed over the last 10 years. This is the future of vaccines. A lot of vaccines are going this road. This was really the first time they had to develop something. But that's why it happened so quick, because remember, they had the genetic sequencing January 10th, 2020. And by March or April, they actually had the vaccine developed and started testing. Um, it is a safe vaccine. If you've had COVID in the past, there is no risk from the vaccine. The vaccine is not gonna make you get sick in terms of COVID. It doesn't give you COVID. It's not a live virus vaccine. It's not possible. Uh, there are some side effects that people get sick at the time of the shot. It's no more than any other vaccine. In the beginning, when it was approved back in December, you know, they had a clinical trial of 60, 70,000 people. Now we have millions of people vaccinated. And we can say after so many people, it, it's, we're not expecting adverse outcomes, that what we've seen is the same as we see for everything else. So of course, you're gonna hear a case, my neighbor's cousin got the vaccine and they developed uh, some weird tingling in their face. Yeah, things are going to happen, but these happen no matter what, with any vaccine and even every day. There's gonna be cases, you know, people get the vaccine and then uh, they, you know, oh, there was a series of cases where someone died after that. Yes, you know, is it because of the vaccine? No, things happen. And after millions of doses, we can say confidently that this vaccine is safe. Of course, every there is a possibility of an anaphylaxis, you know, that's a severe allergic reaction. Things can happen. If you've had this kind of reaction in the past, tell your doctor about it. Vaccine is not for everybody, but guess what? It is for 99% of people out there. Wonderful. I've heard this question a lot. Um, how long do you think we're going to be wearing these masks, Dr. Modak? So I think it's your risk tolerance, right? We talk about this a lot. And I, there's a real spread, right? So I heard actually last night the, uh, the head of the, of the Institute at University of Washington. He was on CNN talking about this. And they do a lot of projections for coronavirus. And they think right now that about 20% of the United States is immune based on vaccine and, um, and having had the infection. There are other people who say, well, we know 20 million people had it. We know that there's three to four times that who actually have had COVID, we just haven't tested for it. So that's like 100 million. And then you add on those vaccinated, even at least one dose, that's that may be half the population. And we also know herd immunity comes at somewhere, you know, between 60, 70, 80 percent. So once we have this herd immunity that, which means that the virus, even if it's circulating enough people around that it won't spread, um, that that's when we can stop wearing masks. So it really depends what the data is and we don't know exactly. So could it be a few months, maybe by summer, and then we stop, maybe. Could it be another year and a half, maybe. I think, you know, especially with winter, because we know what happened last winter, we know that people, I know people got together Thanksgiving, Christmas, I mean, these times, it's not just that it's cold, it's they're going to see their families no matter what, they're going to travel, they're going to do what they're going to do. And I think that same thing's going to happen in 2021. And I think cases are going to go up a little bit. And I think we're going to have a push for masks again, if we stop, I don't think we'll ever stop. So I think it's probably about a year for masks. But again, I don't think that's a bad thing. Right. I think there's going to be things where, OK, you wear a mask and then maybe everyone's vaccinated and you can eat, you know, somewhere with people. And then you remove your mask for a short time, not completely. And you put your mask back on that. You you learn to live with it in a way that's that's reasonable for everyone. 
I mean, you know, I think for some reason we think, oh my God, this mask is like a scarlet letter and we have to get rid of it. You know, a mask is easy as long as we can still do what we want to do safely. That's the key. Wonderful. I've heard this one um, from a lot of people um, th through the last year also about surfaces like playgrounds and mail and library books, pizza boxes, all those things. What do you feel about that? So I think it's less like so in, be in the beginning, of course, right? Everyone was worried. Oh, you have you keep your Amazon deliveries outside for three days and then bring it in. I think that's extremely low risk. So we have not seen that. We've not seen transmission like that. Now, of course, it's possible. Someone has COVID, coughs, uh, 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 and now it's on their hand and they touch your pizza box and hand it to you and you touch it and then you wipe your face. Yeah, that's how viruses are transmitted. We know that happens with common colds, with the flu. Of course, it can happen with COVID. But I think we're all, you know, we're all hopefully using a lot more hand sanitizer. We're washing our hands more. When I go to the grocery store, I come inside, take my groceries out, I wash my hands, and I'm good to go. I don't let things sit there. I don't wipe down my grocery bags. Um, I don't have microwave my food delivery, you know, in another compartment just to kill everything. I feel pretty safe that things are are good, and you know, the little amount that might be on a container, I'm not going to get it. I don't do that. I have friends who still do who are very concerned. Again, it's your risk tolerance. I don't think that's necessary. I'm comfortable not doing things like that. Great. We've seen this one on the news a lot too. What about um, vaccinating pregnant women? So I think it's completely safe. Why do I say that? So we know that for other vaccines, we can give it to pregnant women, right? We encourage flu shot or a tetanus booster. And there's a hundred other things that we have studied that is safe. When, and when any vaccine comes out, the way it's done is we study it in non-pregnant patients first, just to see, is it okay? We study it in adults first. We don't study it in kids. There's a lot of people who study it on. Then if that's okay, which it is, then they expand and say, okay, now let's expand to kids or let's see what happened because there were gonna be some people who were pregnant, didn't know it and got the vaccine. So now where we stand is that a lot of pregnant people have gotten the vaccine with no problem. When it comes to vaccination or medicine or anything we do, we always talk about risks versus benefits. So we know that it doesn't seem to be a risk. Um, we know we don't have you know a million pregnant women who got the vaccine. We followed them for five years to see what happened. We don't have that data, admittedly. But it's there's no reason to think that a risk would happen. So far, everyone we vaccinated, there's been no problem. We also know the risk of getting COVID can lead to problems in pregnancy, preterm delivery. There can be problems with the feed. It, there's it's. I, I'll come back to it. Prevention is the best treatment. Don't get COVID. And the vaccine is going to be a huge step in preventing ACOG, American College of Gynecology, OBGYN Society, they've said, listen, we think everyone should get vaccinated who's pregnant. We think it's safe. Um, if you get vaccinated, it can probably produce antibodies now that are in breast milk that now you're passing on to your newborn child to protect the child from COVID. I mean, a lot of good from this. So I think it's a great thing. Obviously, talk to your doctor about your specific situation, but I think it's a good thing. Yes, the studies of a million pregnant women followed for years are not there. Theoretically, there should be no problem. Wonderful. Um, somebody has one regarding Sweden. How did they flatten that curve without any lockdowns? What do you think about that? So Sweden is an interesting uh, subject. And I. what happened in Sweden is that first they said, you know what, we're not going to do any lockdowns. This is back you know, a year ago. They said, we know it's going to come. We're going to tell everyone who's high risk. So if you're older than 70, just stay at home. Don't worry about it. Everyone else, yeah, go to restaurants, go to your bar. It's fine. You'll get sick. You'll get better. No problem. And as you may imagine, things got a lot worse because they had spread. And at first they said, good, that's fine. We expect that. But the problem is you can't separate the elderly or the high risk from those not at risk. It's not like it's two separate counties. Or, or, I mean, the people are going home to their elderly parents, to their grandparents, right? We interact with each other. That's our society. That's all societies. It's lovely. That's, that's what makes us human. And old people were getting sick and high risk people were dying. And it was terrible. So really what Sweden did is a few months into it, they said, you know what? This is not working well. Let's knock it off. Let's put restrictions on. So they didn't continue this. They saw the error in their ways and started doing more stringent lockdowns. 
So that's how they flatten their curve. Um, you know, and again, there's different degrees of lockdown. We mentioned the US versus other parts of Europe and the curve's gonna go up and down no matter where you are, it's just different degrees. So we know this is coming to a spring break. What are your thoughts on traveling, summer vacations, all those wonderful things? Right, so I think it's, uh, you know, I have kids at home and we wanna go on vacation desperately, right? We, we our last travel as a family was winter of last, of 2019 basically. And since then we haven't done anything. So, you know, I get, I don't even say pressure, but I feel like I want to take my, my kids are doing, you know, they're, they're struggling through this. I want to take my family out. I want to go do things. So what I've done so far is I think going to hotels is okay. I've made that decision. So because in a hotel, I can just get into the room. I don't think it's really uh, spread on surfaces. Everything's cleaned well. I don't have to interact with people. We can take meals outside or in our room just to go for walks in a new city. I've done a couple of hotel stays in DC just to, you know, get out. We did uh, we did it during Christmas time. Saw all the holiday decorations in DC. It was just a fun thing to do. I've gotten used to the cold of being outside a lot now. That's great. I'm not ready to fly yet. I really am scared of flying. So I have I know other people who say, oh, now it's better. Now we're vaccinated. Now I can fly. I don't trust people in the airport. I don't know who people are. I don't know that they're wearing their masks the right way. We are sometimes in a confined space. I don't know who that person is. I think people who are flying, have been flying throughout the world, are probably higher risk of having COVID. So again, I need to know the risk of the ground. I worry about sitting on a jetway, you know, waiting to get on a plane with 30 people. Um, planes have said themselves that, you know, well, the airlines have changed the ventilation. That's good. I don't, I'm not an engineer. I don't know how that works. Really, but even if I buy that, it's risky. Okay, what about on the plane itself? Can I wear a mask? Some people say, I'm going to double mask the whole way. Good. I think that's a great thing. That's what you should do. But what about the guy next week? What about when they serve you uh, a Coca Cola on the flight? Are you going to not drink anything and not eat anything? What if it's a four hour flight? Are you able to do that? Are you able not to go? What if you're on an international flight? You have to go to the Caribbean if you want to travel somewhere. Are you able to keep your mask on the whole time when interacting with all these people? I also don't know what's happening in other countries. And someone wants to go to Costa Rica or Jamaica, maybe they're great. Maybe it's not, but maybe it's not. That's my risk tolerance does not allow me to do that. So I'm not flying. I, I tell you what I am doing, I'm happy to drive somewhere. I'm planning my uh, summer vacation right now, driving trip to Boston, to a national park, to the class, and I want to be outdoors. And I feel like I can do that in the summer. I can do that in the spring break, I want to drive south. I don't mind driving, I don't mind staying in hotels, I don't mind being outside. So I'm planning vacation. We're having a little sound problem, Dr. Modak, so I don't know if you can lean in, but I only have two more questions for you, I promise. Um, Somebody wants to know about um, how discuss how to go about getting the rapid testing for self testing at home. Let's see if your sound is a little better. Okay. So I hope you guys can hear me a little better right now. That's better. Um, to to do the rapid test at home, I think you know there's these companies that do it. I think you could even buy it on Costco.com. They say it's a rapid test, but really what it is is you do the test. I think you have to send it in. Um, and then they'll send you something on your iPad. I don't know if that's how possible it is. If there's a commercial company, or if you've seen something where they said, we'll do it, maybe Quest Labs will do it, and you're able to do it rapidly at home, I, I think it's fine. I think these are all, I think testing is fine. There's nothing wrong with testing. I think as someone with a negative test, it's a lower risk of having COVID. Like we said before, it doesn't mean, a negative test doesn't clear you, but certainly it lowers your risk, right? That if you have a negative test, we can tell you that day you're probably not contagious. We don't know what's going to happen the next day. So I do think it's always a good idea to have a negative test. People say, can I get together with people with a negative test? If they're all tested, we're all negative. I mean, yeah, it's better than getting together with someone with no test, but it, it doesn't mean you're completely clear. I would still stick to the rules. But yes, it is safer. Um, as to how to get it, I'm not sure. I would say, you know, look at look online and if it's available, I think it's fine. It's probably expensive too maybe a hundred dollars a test and you have to think, is it worth it? Is it really going to clear me or can I stick to the MODAC rules and maybe save myself a little money? 
I love this as the last question. What levels will designate the end of the pandemic? So that's a tough question, right? <laughs> we, had, we wanted to do that to you, the last one. <laughs> so is it, are we saying, you know, and I'll, I'm speaking rhetorically, like you can look at this in a lot of ways. Is the end of the pandemic when we have herd immunity? A lot of people think so. So what's herd immunity? Is that when 70 to 80 percent of Americans are vaccinated? Is it when 70 to 80 percent of Americans are vaccinated and have had the virus? But how is the virus changing? We know these variants are coming. It's a mutated virus. Does that mean we have new targets every six months and we have a new vaccine? Um, does it mean when the world is vaccinated, when the world levels have dropped so much? Does it mean when our percent positivity across the country is less than 5 percent? You know, it's so hard to say. Personally, I think we're going to say this has ended when 70 to 80 percent of the world has been vaccinated. And I think, you know, even when we say vaccinated, they are working on updates that it, will it help protect against future variants. So, you know, there may be booster shots needed. I think that's going to be the marker. That's when we can really say, yes, this pandemic is over. Okay, I, and Dr. Modak, I think that's it on the questions. Um, Wonderful, yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Modak. This was incredibly informative, a very uh, rich hour of uh, discussion and conversation. So thank you so much for joining us today. And I wanna thank our audience for being here. We um, loved all your questions and we're so glad you took time out of your day to join us for this lecture. Um, as a reminder, we hold these lectures every fourth Friday of the month on different topics. So I hope you'll join us next month. Um, and, and, and that topic is going to be on home safety and repairs. So shifting gears a little bit. But um, and as a reminder, for those of you who may have not heard this earlier, this um, presentation was recorded. You will get a link to the recording so you can go back and listen to it. There will also be a copy of Dr. Modak's slides that we will send out with that um, with that link. So again, Dr. Yeah, Modak, thank you so much. Yeah, I was gonna say you got a lot, Dr. Modak's got a lot of shout outs here. I just want him to know that. Oh, good, good, thank good, you. that's right. Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. All right, thank you. Okay. All right, well, this concludes our webinar and I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend.